of when we're talking about the brain basis of emotion and visual perception and decision making, and somebody will raise their hand and say, well, what about free will? Okay, professional neuroscientists don't tend to ask this kind of question. Uh, my first off kind of flip answer to this is uh, I'm not a fatalist, but even if I were, what could I do about it? <laughs> That's a quote from someone. I don't remember where I got that, but it's, it's not original with me, but it, it's, it's funny. Okay, so what, what I think is that we all want to get to some sort of, when we talk about freedom and free will, we want to get to some sort of notion that we have some level of control over our actions. And I would put it this way succinctly. I would say that my behavior is caused at least in part by my beliefs, my values, my memories, my goals, and my aspirations. Now, I say that acknowledging that much of our behavior is not caused by those things that we desire. Much of our behavior is caused by cultural biases that we're not even aware of, by family of origin biases and shaping, by childhood traumas that you know, we're only dimly if, aware of, if at all. Uh, but at least some part of it, in order to have a meaningful understanding of freedom, our choices have to be governed by our highest values and our aspirations. Um, so I, I wanna put a corollary on here is that conscious rational thought plays a causal role in my behavior. So there is a tendency in some circles to think of consciousness and the conscious narratives we have about our reasons for choosing things and doing things. It's just froth, it's epiphenomenal, it's froth on the top of a wave, it has no, car, no real causal power, it's just narratives that we tell ourselves to try to make sense of the world. Uh, but I actually think that consciousness plays a causal role in my behavior, and we can talk about that. The most clear example is this matter of bringing unconscious biases into consciousness. If somebody shows me papers that I've graded over you know, a 10-year period, and I'm systematically discriminating against some group, whether it's gender or ethnic or regional accent, how well you speak English, whatever, uh, there was a bias in my behavior that I wasn't even aware of, presumably. Uh, but I can't do anything about that bias until I become conscious of it, okay? And that's really critical. It's only when you become aware of the things that are driving your behavior and your choices that suddenly it opens the playing field. It opens a degree of freedom uh, to make different choices than you have in the past. And that's, that's the, uh, a key causal role for consciousness. And in talking about uh, the self-determination, uh, as a neuroscientist trying to puzzle about um, b beliefs and values and memories and goals, some of those things we've made progress on in neuroscience, especially memory, I think. But many of the rest of these remain mysterious. Uh, but the key issue that we need to get down to is what counts as a cause, okay? And uh, getting into this, I think um, I'll, I'll I'll lean on a, an observation that was made by uh, Carl Craver, uh, notably a neurophilosopher who's at Washington University, St. Louis, uh, but others as well. And the observation here is that neuroscience explanation is intrinsically multi-level. Okay, so it's not good enough. There is no level of explanation for behavior that's fundamental, and when we get to that fundamental level, we're going to throw away all the other levels. So let's deal with an example right here. So I'm gonna just take you into the mind of a neuroscientist or neuroscience just for a few minutes here. Um, so here's an example of something that neuroscientists like to study. It's long-term spatial memory. And long-term spatial memory is what you rely on to find your car in a parking lot like this, okay? Frequently, I can't even remember which parking lot I parked the car in, much less how to find it. But many people are actually very good at this sort of thing, long-term spatial memory, and neuroscientists would like to know how does that work? How does it work in the brain? And the very first thing that neuroscientists do is they take this general problem in psychology and they reduce it to a, an, an, a, a situation that you can actually study in a lab. So frequently that is a mouse navigating a water maze. Uh, so you train, you train the mouse to navigate a maze that can be on dry land or it can be, the mouse can be swimming in the water and um, that's your operationalization of spatial memory. Uh, but then you say, well, how does the mouse manage to do these tricks reliably? And one of the things that we've discovered at the next lower level is that there's a structure in the mouse brain and our brains called the hippocampus uh, that actually functions as sort of a little GPS and is really critical for this ability to do spatial navigation. And some of you will know that a Nobel Prize was won for that work or awarded for that work about five years ago. 
Um, but you say, well, how does this map get formed in the hippocampus? And when you put an animal in a new environment, uh, how does a new map get formed? And the answer in part is that it, at the cellular level, um, uh, this phenomenon called long-term potentiation is a mechanism for changing the strength of synapses in the hippocampus and elsewhere in the brain. So the strength of synapses, that is the communication joint between one neuron and the next neuron, those can be regulated upward or they can be regulated downward. And this LTP phenomenon is critical to the establishment of new long-term memories. Uh, but how does long-term potentiation actually work? Well, it turns out there are molecules at synapses lying in the cell membrane called NMDA receptors. And these receptor molecules are really critical for long-term potentiation. But you say, well, how do those NMDA receptors get there? And the answer is that that process is controlled by expression of genes uh, in the nerve cells. And so you have at least six levels we've identified here in the study of, of spatial memory and its neural mechanisms. And an important thing to realize is that uh, all of these levels are actually essential. There is no level that has fundamental privilege. Now, I know neuroscientists who believe that genes are the fundamental level of explanation. They're genetic fundamentalists, okay? I know other neuroscientists who believe that the synaptic plasticity is the fundamental level of explanation. And they, you know, they have a different one. But the reality is all of these are important. And of course, we could go all the way down here to chemical bonds and physics. Um, and we could go up higher in this hierarchy, up to societies and uh, how we solve traffic problems. But I think the heart of the explanation about spatial memory lies right in here. But importantly, all of these levels are critical. And I've drawn these arrows, sort of arrows of causality in both directions. And what they mean is that neuroscientists, the whole way we can identify a mechanism like this in, in the first place is because we can manipulate one level, like the hippocampus, and we can show that long-term potentiation changes. Or we can manipulate long-term potentiation. We can produce knockout mice who have very little long-term potentiation, and then the spatial maps in the hippocampus change tri quite dramatically. So the key, is, the key point is that uh, we can manipulate at any given level of the system and have effects on downward levels, or you can manipulate here and have effects upward. And that's how we know, that's what we do in the lab every day. That's how we know we're dealing with a mechanism. If you manipulate one of these and you affect the hippocampus, but you manipulate the hippocampus and you have no effect on long-term potentiation, uh, then you start to suspect you don't have a mechanism after all. You've been chasing a false hypothesis. And this, this mutual manipulation between levels is really important, I think. And this is a little advertisement for Carl Craver's uh, book, which is conveniently entitled Explaining the Brain. Um, and uh, the, he talks about multi-level mechanistic explanation in neuroscience. And I, I have this nice quote here uh, from Carl. And he talks about this concept of mutual manipulability. And he says, a part is a component in a mechanism if one can change the behavior of the mechanism as a whole by intervening to change the component, and one can change the behavior of the component by intervening to change the behavior of the mechanism as a whole. And he calls this making a difference. And that's what we care about as scientists in the lab, is making a difference. So I don't think this is sort of uh, philosophical word games. I think he's onto something here that maps onto my experience in the lab. Now, I can see some thought bubbles over some heads out there and say, you know, what does all of this mean? Why is he talking to me about this long-term spatial memory stuff? I lost track of what's at stake here. So let's go back a couple of slides and say the key thing, the key meaningful concept of freedom, I think, is this issue of self-determination, autonomy and responsibility, and the key issue being what counts as a cause. Uh, and the core um, observation is that all of those levels of explanation are necessary to account for something like long-term spatial memory. There's none of them that are dispensable. So how that cashes out for me is that it means that my beliefs, my actions, my values, which I think are higher order configurations of nervous system, they're patterns of activity at the highest levels of the central nervous system, and they count as causes. And I see no problem with believing that, thinking that. In fact, I see every problem, to, every motivation to embrace that from the point of view of neuroscience. So, if we can find a way to talk meaningfully about non-fundamental causation, and I think we have to, then we can take mental causation seriously and I think personal responsibility for our choices seriously. 
So note that I'm not making an argument here about any extra material um, uh, substance or anything. I, I would put myself in David's category of a non-reductionist materialist. I'm a materialist. I don't postulate any extra substances. I think an aspiration, a belief, a goal, as I said, is a higher order configuration of neural activity. Uh, but I think those higher order con configurations are part of the causal story of our behavior. Now, uh, one other little caveat here. This is not to say that bottom-up causes are unimportant. I emphatically don't believe that. Explanatory relevance, remember from that figure, it runs up and down, okay? All the way up and down the hierarchy. And I'll just echo this slide, which you saw before in David's talk, uh, which is, shows that there is overwhelming scientific evidence now that the best treatment for really serious depression is a combination of antidepressant drugs and psychotherapy, which is frequently cognitive behavioral therapy. And our patients do better on those two together, on average, than they do on either alone. And I think that this scientific finding that David introduced to you says a lot about who we are as human beings. Uh, the, the, the antidepressant drugs are a classic bottom-up intervention. You're going way down the system, several levels down to the level of neurotransmitters and receptors, and you're turning knobs there, okay? And patients get better with that kind of knob. That, that's their, that knob is on the reality of who we are as humans. But cognitive behavioral therapy or other kinds of therapy are top-down interventions. They actually aim to change a patient's beliefs or patterns of interaction with the world. So here is a knob that's up here at a very high level, and we're trying to turn that knob without any regard, any particular regard to neurotransmitters or, or um, receptor molecules in the brain. And the, the fundamental fact from this clinical insight that's come from David's field, psychiatry, is that cognitive restructuring is possible from therapy. Cognitive restructuring is the goal of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and it means that beliefs matter in the end, that we as human beings are both. We, we, it's bottom up is not sufficient to tell our story, and top down alone is not sufficient to tell our story. We are both, and your beliefs matter. And I think that the beliefs, beliefs mattering is the key to understanding autonomy and acquiring a, a scientifically insightful and personally satisfying notion of freedom. And um, I'll say that understanding the nature of human freedom is the most consequential problem facing the neurobehavioral sciences. I, I really believe that. Uh, some days I think, no, 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 curing Alzheimer's is the most important problem. Uh, and um, but I, for the long run, I really think that understanding freedom is the most consequential thing. And it's important for obvious reasons of human dignity, social responsibility, um, but it's also uh, important for science itself because science is, is fundamentally based on the notion that we have a freedom to choose. We have a freedom to conclude one thing about what's going on in the world or a different thing depending on the evidence and the quality of evidence. Uh, and if we... If we dismiss that as scientists, then we cut off the very ground, the intellectual limb that we're standing on, and the result will be intellectual freefall. Uh, so this understanding that I'm trying to promote here of neuroscience and mind and matter doesn't prove anything religiously. This is a veritas forum. You know, we're trying to speak truth to each other, and it's motivated in part to have a dialogue about Christian worldview and uh, religious worldviews in general. And I've had something to say about that tonight, but the, the free will business, uh, I'm trying to come to um, an accurate, truthful understanding of what we're about as humans. And what I've said here doesn't prove anything religiously, but, and this is important, I think that this view is open to a holistic and profoundly religious view of the human person and our quest for meaning in this universe.